Ah, uh, yes. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. We're recording this episode live on July 13th, 2023. I'm your host, Nick Rome. I'm joined today by Mr. Barry Kirby. Hello, and it's good to be back after our week hiatus. Yes, we... <laughs> We are back. We have an awesome show lined up for you tonight. We're going to be diving into hostile design. What is it? How could it impact social inequality in our cities? And uh, that's not all. We're going to be answering some questions from the community. Uh, we've got someone looking to implement user research for their small company. We're also going to tackle the question about asking for advice on gaining confidence in their abilities. And just from today's chat, in uh, it's, it's kind of like a live on the fly edit. Um, a question about feeling, uh, fearing failure in UX research. But first, uh, let's go ahead and get into some community updates, programming notes, if you will. Tomorrow, this is the first thing I'll say, 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 Eastern, there will be an HFES town hall. Now, this will be a great opportunity for all of you to show up and ask HFES leadership and others questions that you might have. Tomorrow's topic is getting involved the internal affairs, internal affairs division, but there's going to be much more than just that. So please attend if you can. Uh, again, it will be live on all the platforms you're experiencing now, as well as all the official HFES channels. Now, for the other piece of news, we were off last week, but that doesn't mean that we weren't doing some fun stuff in the meantime. Safe and Effective Episode 2 is out now. Join Heidi as she sits down with Maggie Reef to talk about uh, a, a conversation from the medical device development uh, from a device engineer's perspective. Uh, so all the human factors chat about device engineering, really interesting chat. I, it's always weird. I said this in the pre-show because I sit in on these conversations. I'm not part of them. And so it's like, yes, I've lived this, but I'm listening to it. So anyway, go listen to it. It's out now, literally on any of your uh, podcatcher platforms, safe and effective episode two. Barry, I have to know what's going on with the latest over at 1202. Well, I've got to be brutally honest, and not a huge amount recently. The um, We've had the same episode uh, with Kate Preston. It's a fantastic episode, so really well worth listening. Um, but we've had it up there a while because everything else has been flat out, so we've got no new episodes Um or we've had no new episodes come up. However, there is a new episode coming in either this Monday or next Monday on Human Facts Integration, which is going to be really well worth listening to. Um, we're just getting some final ticks in the boxes for that. And then we've got some other cool um, interviews lined up. So a bit of a hiatus at the moment, but uh, new content coming soon. Exciting. I'm excited because I finally caught up on my 1202 feed. So I'm excited for more stuff. Anyway, we got a great topic tonight. Let's get into it. That's right. This is the part of the show all about Human Factors News. Barry, what is the story this week? So this week we are talking about hostile design and how can urban design impact social inequality? This article explores the concept of hostile architecture, which refers to the intentional design strategies that control, direct, or inhibit human behavior in urban spaces. Examples include benches with armrests positioned in the middle to prevent people from lying down, metal spikes attached to services to deter skateboarders, and high-frequency sound devices to discourage groups of teenagers from congregating. Hostile architectures has its roots in the defensive architecture of ancient times and the Middle Ages, where cities were designed to control and secure their populations. Today, this type of design is used to address perceived problems and challenges in urban spaces, but it does carry significant social implications. Critics argue that their hostile, architect hostile architecture perpetuates social inequalities and marginalizes vulnerable populations, while proponents claim it is necessary for maintaining order and cleanliness in public spaces. However, research shows that hostile design merely displaces undesirable behaviors without addressing the root causes. Moreover, the ethicality of these design strategies is called into question as they deliberately increase discomfort and exclude certain individuals from public spaces. Ultimately, the conversation around hostile architecture highlights the need for a more compassionate and comprehensive approach to urban design, one that considers the needs and rights of all the citizens and seeks to create inclusive and welcoming environments. So, Nick, what do you think? What are your thoughts on the the bench down your local park where you can't have a, have a sleep on it overnight? 
Look, I think um, this is a really cool topic and a great article over at UX Collective. I'd ensure I'd uh, encourage all of you to go watch, not watch, go read the original article. I think there's a lot of really interesting points there and is one of the reasons why we selected it as a topic to talk about on the show. I think this is very cool because it's something that it's it's almost like dark patterns in UX, where if you think about sort of these things that exist to get you to do something that you may not want to do, right? Uh, it's it's just a really fascinating topic to me. And um, so cool topic, but is it not so cool from a basic human necessity standpoint? I'm not sure it is. I think there's, I, I'm not necessarily pro-hostile architecture here, but I think is this or the fact that we have or design for hostile architecture, a reflection of us as a society and our failure to address some of these root cause issues like homelessness or public disorder. Like how can we as a society better accommodate people in such a way that we don't necessarily have to do hostile design to get the desired behaviors that we want. So Fascinating from that perspective. Barry, what are your thoughts on the article? So I'm in a similar boat. I really like this topic because from a human factors perspective, we get to explore this from from both approaches almost, from a the different users, the different stakeholders involved, and really how do we balance that and balance them requirements off each other. So at one extreme, we sort of highlight it in the in the article where it's where it talks about uh, medieval design with walls and things like that. A modern perspective, we use fences, we use walls. I mean, we put barbed wire on the top of them, we put razor wire on them to control where people go and people's access. Um, it's not that long ago. I used to know that where you had a brick wall and people would um, concrete broken glass into the top of it um, to make sure that nobody would climb over. Um, and where we use these techniques to stop, say, loitering, you know, like groups of kids hanging out are where we, we know these groups of kids cause trouble. Um, we know that these groups of kids have, you know, will do graffiti and street vandalism. That's then seen as a positive by the community because we have this inbuilt idea that we see a group of kids and they're, they're, they're clearly, they must be doing wrong things because that's what groups of kids do, isn't it? Um, which is clearly, that was sarcasm if, if that didn't come over. Um, but then also, like we, the I guess the more um, emotive one really is where we where we see homeless people sleeping on benches and in doorways. Um, but we can see that from a business owner's perspective. If you if you run a business or your your own home, if you live in a in a block of flats or something, you you go down to the hallway, the, the flats, and there's there's people rough sleeping. Well, you don't want people sleeping in your doorway um, for for a number of reasons. Um, and if you're looking after the town or the city or you know the the com communal spaces, then the benches are made to be sat on. They're not made to be slept on. Um, so working in this way, then actually you're using design abilities to make sure the seats are being used for what it is that they've been designed to do. Because they're a seat, they're not a makeshift bed. But then you circle right back to why are people have to sleep on there in the first place. That is user behaviour. That is they are residents too. Um, so if they can't sleep on there, they still need to sleep somewhere, but so just shifting them or we're just moving the problem out. It's an out of sight, out of mind type of thing. Um, we, we, we're not fixing the other half of the equation, um, which we then therefore have a responsibility as a society to do, but bring that back to a human factors perspective. Is that our problem? Is that something that we should be cognizant of? Um, given when we're trying to solve the problem, how, how, where, where is our moral boundary? Where is our, uh, thing on that? Cause there's loads of other bits of elements where we deliver human factors without necessarily thinking about the, the ethical standpoint in society, shall we say? So yeah, it's interesting. It's, that's why I think it's a great topic because it, it, it yeah. brings everything in together. The, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of ways and, there's a lot of places we can go with this discussion. I'd like to start off with a social thought. And if you want your social thought to be read on the show, uh, we do post all over internet. So just comment and we'll find it. Uh, but Neil, one of our patrons here, ever carry Allen wrenches or other similar small tools with you while walking around cities asking for a friend? Uh, and I mean, like, he's right. There, there's, it is an inconvenience 
um, not only for the people that they're designing this for. And like, I, it's, it's interesting because who is actually designing these is, is it UX researchers? Is it human factors engineers? Like is who is doing the design of this where it is intentionally, um, I don't know, tr trying to target a certain demographic. I think it's it's interesting from that perspective. I thought it'd be good to go over just a couple examples of this. You mentioned a few in the blurb, right? Uh, armrests on benches. In fact, you can go and look at our thumbnail for an example of this one. There's a woman trying to lay down and she can't do it because there's an armrest there. Um, so armrests on benches, you think about things like metal spikes. And I think you also mentioned the high frequency sound devices that are only being able to be picked up by younger ears, right? And so it's <laughs> targeting an age demographic. There's uh, other different types of things that I think there's some really obvious examples and then there's some subtle examples. And so we can go over some of those. The anti-skateboarding, um, I don't know, they're like little metal strips that they put on curbs so that way people can't grind down them on their skateboards. There's other sort of obvious ones like boulders or rocks, uh, in certain placements so that way people can't sit or congregate in those spaces. There's also making the benches themselves uh, sloping or uncomfortable. And I think, you know, being able to not sit in a place for a long time is probably, you know, intentional in, in a lot of cases. Um, then there's also some really subtle examples like the high frequency one, unless you know it exists, that's not something that you are necessarily privy to all the time, you know, like if you can't hear it because you've already lost all those, uh, you know, all those cells in your ear, like <laughs> then you're not going to be, you're, you're not going to be bothered by it. It's only young well, people. Interesting yeah, fact. I, I could hear them up until I was about 30. Is it, they're, they're meant to be j just up until, until what, 18, 19, something like that. Yeah. Uh, um, I could hear them well into, well into my thirties. Good um, for you. <laughs> well, not really, because it's really irritating. <laughs> <laughs> but there's some other subtle examples as well. So um, blue lights in bathrooms. And this is not one that I immediately thought of, but sort of the the uh, the blue light, it's being lit with blue light to make it harder to find veins that yeah. you can, you, know, you you can read between the lines there. Um, well, you, just to jump in, we had a social thought on exactly that topic. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it's probably worth highlighting. So this is from uh, Kim Darkin, and she said, she sort of highlights it's awful. In some cases, it can do more harm. So the use of blue lighting in stairwells and under bridges to stop people injecting drugs because it's hard to see veins in blue light. If someone is that desperate that they are injecting in a car park, a blue light will not stop them, but it will make it more dangerous for them and the community as there's more likelihood of a blood spill. Blood spill, yes. Um, surely the money spent on these initiatives would be better spent on, on support, which is kind of what we said earlier as well. Um, but again, it's interesting, isn't it? It's, it's that whole um, in, unintended consequence of what seems on paper, yeah, logical idea. Um, but then it's that wider implication of, well, so what? Yeah, I think you're right. I think that that's a great, thank you for bringing in that, uh, that social thought. Um, was kind of just rolling here. Uh, we let's see here. The 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 idea of bench bars. Have you seen these? I've seen these, and these are annoying. Where instead of like the sit down benches, these are uh, you lean up against them, and it's kind of like just a place to lean and relax instead of sit and relax. Um, so that that brings in another social thought. Go I'll, for I'll, it. I'll, so just to. So Claire Haslam highlights most bus shelters, and actually, what she's referring to there is in the UK, um, we've we have a lot more of these these bench bars um, as part of a part of a bus stop. Um, so, and I know of a specific instance. So when I was a um, when I was a councillor, that there was a particular bus stop outside of somebody's house where people, where younger people in, in particular, were congregating around this um, this bus stop, and I got called in to um by the by the owners of these of the houses right next to it saying we're getting all these people congregating all the time what what can we do about it and that was one of the solutions that was recommended was that we put in these bench bars so people couldn't sit i think it was like well but what about people who actually need the seats when they come to get on the bus um so that was a bit crazy but yeah so we see a lot more of the of, of bench bars being used in places where you traditionally have a seat right 
Um, and then the use of uncomfortable material or design. And when these seats or benches are made from uncomfortable materials or designed in a way that's uncomfortable to sit in for a long time, that's another uh, subtle example of this hostile architecture. And then the last sort of example I have is narrow or uncomfortable sidewalks. And this is one where if you don't want large groups together in one space, you you make the sidewalk narrower. So that way there's, you know, an intent behind not being able to gather in that area. And so I think these are these are some really interesting examples that we can think about as we look at this topic. And I guess we'll bring in sort of the last social thought here that we have, at least in the show notes, is that uh, this is by Sarah. And she writes, I imagine many stories can be told by people with disabilities, visible and invisible, about how they've been excluded from spaces. The impacts on the sense of place and active omission can seem like commission in design. And then also urban versus uh, versus urban space designed to bolster the needs of children or older users or welcome pets, sort of that inclusive community. And so I think this is a really interesting uh, point that we can use as kind of like a springboard. What do you think, Barry? It's, it is a really interesting point that the, is every space intended to be used by every person? So if you've got, I mean, so if a public space is turned into a skate park, for example, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, um, well, that automatically excludes me from that space because the chance of me getting on a skateboard and surviving are very, very slim indeed. Um, equally, um, there's there's other spaces which aren't made for, for the youth to go and use um, that may be made for people who prefer walking through tranquil gardens and things like that. Um, even just general grass, some people can't access grass because um, it's either too muddy for, like, say, wheelchairs or people on um, crutches and things like that. They're, they're not – some things that are very – would seem to be very simple to to access maybe, maybe are not. Um, but I think there is a difference in maybe not really thinking about exactly who should um, – or a, focusing a, a space on a, on a, on a particular demographic – um, which I think is different to what um, Sarah's pointing out, where she's highlighting, actually, if, if you don't think about who is going to use the space and make a conscious decision that they are either included or excluded from that space or maybe not, it's not focused towards them, um, are, are two different things. And I think, I think she's quite right there. Um, but it is interesting. So look at these going through some of these obvious um, examples. So we noticed um, when we were out yesterday, so some examples of of these benches that have armrests in the middle of them. And in fact, I've chucked a picture in the show notes of what, of a, of, that was a live photo that we took yesterday, um, which doesn't help anybody else on the podcast, but, but I can see it. Um, and that was just- can see the notes. <laughs> That's true. And so that was just us yesterday, sort of like um, highlighting the fact that there was no way. So it's it's just a normal, it's a wooden metal and wooden bench with a metal arm right in the middle of it. Um, so there's no way that anybody could lie down on it. I did ask um, Amanda to lie down on the bench to prove the example that she was unwilling to do so in the middle of the public forum. Um, I think that, I mean, do you think that that is different from the anti-skateboarding devices. So the anti-skateboarding stuff where kids can go and uh, basically stopping them um, doing using the street furniture as a playground. So the street furniture, which is totally not intended uh, to be um, that sort of use. Do you, do, do you think that's different? Do you think that's right? Uh, just put you on the spot. Uh, this, yeah, I mean, this feels like a gotcha question, Bear. Because I mean, look, look, like the the intent behind benches is to allow people to sit and rest, and if somebody is still intending to rest by sleeping, are you you're preventing them from sleeping by putting that arm in the middle of it, right? Just like you're preventing somebody from skateboarding, from uh, from skateboarding on you know, with the with the metal strips, and. But, I mean, what is the intent behind curbs and retaining walls? Like, think about it. What What is the intent behind them? Well, it's to define a space, right? It is to define either a, uh, a sidewalk or, uh, like in the instance of a retaining wall, it is to sort of keep things in, okay? Uh, like dirt or plants or whatever it is. 
the intent behind that is not to be a playground for people to skate on. And to me, this hostile architecture uh, of including things like uh, a a center bar on a bench that is a little different from you know putting the metal strips it's it's a matter of maintenance versus perception because i think in the case of of the metal strips that is a maintenance question when skateboards grind on curbs uh, it can damage them um it can make them unsightly but if somebody sleeps on a bench that doesn't do anything for the bench it is a perception problem about the city then at that point at least to me and so i do think they're different in terms of the intent because you could have um very much like a, a it's the difference between dark patterns and intuition <laughs> i guess <laughs> where you know you, you do something because it's intuitive and when it's a when it's something that you want to do, it's pleasant, but when it's something that is benefiting the company that is doing that dark pattern, then it's like you view it in a different light. And so I, f- I feel it's very similar to that where um, it's a feature, not a bug to have <laughs> the strips. And then it's also, uh, you know, it, it's definitely keeping homeless people out when you have that bar in the middle of it. Like, let's be clear. So it's it's a difference between perception and maintenance for me because keeping the kids from grinding their skateboards down a curb is a maintenance problem because that's not their intended use keeping people from sleeping on a bench well the bench is for resting so you just don't want people sleep in there because you think it's going to lead to encampments so that's that's my thoughts on it what do you think yeah i mean i'm we, we we might I, I might agree more violently with you because uh, I do think that, you know, the anti-skateboard devices, um, so if you're skateboarding off street furniture, off curbs, off things like that, the chances of you having an injury or you, you know, um, doing something and hitting somebody else, having an injury or damaging the um, the the curbs or whatever it is it, it itself, that is not, it's not being anti-social. It's not being um, anti-people. It's asking you not to, um, not to ruin the thing there, there are other right. places to go on skateboard go on skateboard have fun um but but the, this is this is almost uh, encapsulates what i'm about to say about the armrest we know that kids like to skateboard i'm grown up grown up like to skateboard too um so we know people like to skateboard and so we turn around and say we 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 see your skateboarding and we give you your skate parks we give you you know um certainly in the uk we see more and more pop up skate parks pop up half pipes and things like that so we recognize that people want to do this and so because it's the kids and because it's cool, we, we, we build them nice little skate parks uh, to go That's and do great. it. That's great. And that means that we can turn around and say, will you stop skateboarding in our lo- in the in the public space and trying to endanger people? Go to the skate park. You give them somewhere to go. Right. That's great. But, but, and this is where the, what if you don't well, have the money for both? Well, let, let me finish my good point first. And go then, you, then, you, then, you, then you can, you can shreds. <laughs> this is my problem with the, the armrests on benches, because on the one hand, this is a great piece of human factors engineering. The requirement has been people are spending, people are sleeping on the benches, which is really not what they're designed to do. Um, it's not good for their own health. It's not good for the perception of this of wherever that where wherever it's that where wherever it's at. It will increase literally in, in, include you know. Th- there's loads of reasons why sleeping on park benches is not great. A for the person, B for the the local area. So we we do all week. So we do, we've come up with a design here that stops them from doing that. Brilliant. A bit like putting the um, the anti anti skateboard devices on. We've come with with a solution. What we haven't done here is turn around and say you can't sleep here, but you can sleep over here. We haven't given that balance that um, that 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 alternative place that 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 we can that we do. Um, so. All of these things, um, I think, need to be in in balance because it, it's a bit like you when you know if you tell your children off, you 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 stop stop doing that or don't do that now, but you can go and do something over there. You give them that, you give them an alternative outlet, um, and I think that's where that's where the whole um, 
for us, that would be a the process or procedure that's put into place. So we have the initial requirement of we don't want people sleeping here. This is how we're going to design that out. But you would have the the so what part of that and saying, right, well, the the other bit of that, we've done the physical bit, but what about the environmental bit where you turn around and say, right, so what is the knock-on effect? We're going to have people who need to sleep somewhere. They've got nowhere to sleep now because we've, we've, we've put in a piece of hardware. Where do they, they, they then go? So you're going to count. You're going, to, you're going to give me a counterpoint. Well, yeah, no, I was just going to say. Well, what if you had, what if you don't have the money for both? And that's exactly the the second point that you were making there. It's almost like I shouldn't have interrupted you while you were talking. But here's the thing: like, you, you know, you're right. Why, why are we spending money on skate parks and not homeless shelters? Like, that's and that's not a question that we can answer. But also thinking about sort of the cost of these patches, right? What is the cost benefit to having? a center bar on a uh, on a bench, right? Well, it probably costs not that much to include that on the thing. The benefit, I, I use that in air quotes for people listening. The benefit is that there's no visible uh, person staying there for an extended period of time. Yeah. But you're right. What Then the trade-off to that is that, yes, they go somewhere else. Now, the same thing can be said about the other example, the metal strips for skateboarding. What is the cost of building a skate park versus the cost of building uh, or, or including these strips? I mean, I, I would imagine that the cost is quite significant to reserve a part of the land for a skate park versus just including these metal strips on the thing, right? Like that's, it's the same argument, but there's different, I guess, intent behind them right you give a you give a skate park for somebody to skate because the thing that the curbs are not meant to be skated on like i'm arguing that the bench is meant for resting maybe not for extended periods and if you go by that definition then fine um i think the interesting thing to me here is that when we look at the world through this lens when we take away like imagine a world where we take away hostile architecture what happens well we have uh, people who are finding places to sleep. And we have people who are using the environment, the city as their playground. And we also have people who are doing what many would consider socially um, uh, inexcusable behaviors and practices like drug use in these public places, right? Um, and And so what exactly do... When we look at a world where that is happening, I think it would be much more likely that we would try to do something about it. And to me, hostile architecture is a patch that says, let's just put this off to the side so that way we don't see it out of sight, out of mind. We don't have to worry about it because we've patched the good area. And again, good is in air quotes there. We've patched the good area and we're going to keep it tidy. So that way, the perception of this area is clean and we don't have to do about the other things because they're going down the hill to the park that really, you know, we don't. This is what people see. The park, eh, whatever they can find, they, they, you know, so like I, that's that's to me what is happening here. It's a patch to fix a problem. And then when it is out of sight, it is out of mind. And then we don't do anything to solve the problem. It's a much larger societal issue. But that, to me, is what's happening here. So to play devil's advocate and or devil's human factors advocate is if my requirement is sent to me that um, I've got a, a public space, I will never be in charge of the city or the country, um, unless anybody wants to make me prime minister. Then knock yourselves out. Um, but I'm not. If I've got, if I'm in a position of responsibility of looking after a certain area, then I'm going to look after that area. That's my area of responsibility, um, and it's not. I don't have the as a human factors practitioner in this element. I don't have the the tools or wherewithal or even responsibility to worry about society's homeless, do I? So if I, if me or you were given the brief of we've got these places for people to sit in, um, 
but they're being taken over by people who are sleeping on them, which is not an intended use of a bench um, because that's what it's, it's not a bed. Um, what can we, what can we do about it to make, to make that? Cause it, it you could take away the if you took away the the benches and replaced them with single seat chairs. So there weren't benches; there were chairs closest together, but with gaps and things. Is that hostile architecture, or is that good planning, or is that is that good design? Because you know you 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 can sit on them; it's clearly intended to be a seat, um, things like that. So, I guess what I'm getting at is, from a human factors perspective, from a design perspective, these are good. These are ways of thinking around the problem and and delivering um, what it is that they need to be. Um, it kind of goes back to what I was saying with my uh, with my initial thoughts of we get involved in other areas of design development that have an have a consequence that we are happy to ignore. Um, I guess without beating around the bunch, I've worked in defense now for twenty odd years, um, and there is a I, I we we dress it all up in being very nice about um, what it is that we are engaging with and this, that, and the other. But fundamentally, there's elements there that, without being rude, put a kinetic effect and and, and enables people to kill people with much more effectively. Um, and this is almost the, a, a similar issue that we've the people have come up with designs, which from a human factors perspective, I think are quite good, but social, sociably unpalatable. How do yeah, we, I was going to say... I was gonna say you call these things good, but like, is it? <laughs> like, it's it. I, I would argue that they're effective design. Um, yeah. That you know they 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 are getting people off the benches. They are stopping people they're, from they do the job. Therefore, they're good. Yeah, exactly. They, they're effective. <laughs> they're effective. And what what is good is a societal fundamental question that we all need to think about in our head. Right. And, and yeah. so uh, that's, that, that is part of the question though. Would, you know, if, if we as a society thought that it was just that people don't have a place to sleep, would we then think this is good design, right? Like, do you think it's, do you think it's good design when you sign up for a service that you didn't mean to? through dark patterns like is that good design oh, it's effective design it's effective design um i mean I, I guess on the one hand because we're dealing with homelessness and and that's what that that's more emotive um because i think we're also good um good social thinking people and therefore we want to do the right thing overall and sometimes i think it can be quite hard to um distill the two one from the other um i guess a, a less Possibly less about it. So the the high frequency sound device, the uh, the mosquito device that they that you can put out. So like as I said earlier, I can hear them outside. I used to be able to hear them outside shops till quite late on, even though it was promised that no only children can hear about. And and we want to deter um, groups of of younger people congregating together. Why do we want to deter groups of younger people congregating together? Um, it's a perception issue that we think because there's a group of kids all getting together they're going to do bad things and people feel intimidated um again going back to uh my cancer days i was going past an underpass in in the area that we uh, that we lived in and a woman came up to me and said you need to do something about that that group of people over there that group of kids over there and there's a group of maybe 10 12 kids um hanging around i was like well what have they done well, they're hanging around. And I'm like, right, get that. That that's cool. What have they done? Um, well, I, I feel intimidated. Right, okay. You, I, and it's perfectly legitimate that you feel intimidated. But what have they done? Have they done something to make you feel intimidated? Because you're on the other side of the road. They were quite quite far away from. So again, it's for me, it's this almost perception thing around. Um, just because we've got a group of young people, they're not necessarily who I am. Therefore, I feel intimidated. Maybe it's influenced by social media, what we see in the news, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so why the need for these devices as such? Um, are they bad? Or are the fact are they're keeping groups of kids away from certain areas? I mean, I know one shop that used it around their loading bay, um, which seemed a more legitimate use of it because they wanted to make sure that there, there was no groups congregating. So when the trucks reversed it, they, 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 it, it was safer. At least that was a logical argument. But then we do, we have them in public spaces, and I don't think that's legit. Um, I don't know. What, what what do you think about? Do do you think 
these non so you know these sound devices aren't hurting anybody no they're the, i mean look the the intent behind what, what we're talking about the topic of hostile architecture it is really a way to control or direct mm -hmm. people in certain ways and if you look at the origins of hostile design as we're talking about it today this is another fascinating look that the article takes so i again encourage you all to go read listen to it but they talk about the origin of hostile design and and in ancient times the intent here was to be defensive right you think about building walls to protect your people from those that are not you the other. There's always a fear of the other, the fear of the unknown. The, the more, this is why, um, just generally, why you see sort of um, more progressive policy that is inclusive in major city centers is because you experience more diverse perspectives than your own versus living in the rurals where you don't necessarily get a diverse perspective. It's us versus them. And so when you think about trying to protect your own, the thought of hostile architecture of of trying to control control or direct another group right if it's if it's homeless that's another group you do not belong to that group as a city planner or you know somebody with a job you know like you don't belong to that group and so they're other it's fear of the other and that again like it's just getting at the ancient purpose of hostile design is where we have to come back to and so when I think about hostile design in cities, it is because we don't we we aren't getting that perspective in the in the design phase. Right. Is it good design if we're not accommodating for all the users? Mm -hmm. Right. If you think about a public place and public facilities, i.e. a bench, if you are not, you know, getting a representation of all the users, including those without homes, including those who want to skate in the public place. Are you are you building something that is I mean, is it going to be effective for most people? I, that's something that you can argue. Is it something that's good for all people? No, we can objectively say no. Right. And so. We can objectively say that, right? We we can objectively say that it's not good for all people. No, it's it's definitely not good for all people. Um, flip side, <laughs> counterpoint, does that mean that I should be designing beds in my public spaces? No. Why not? Because is it good for all people? No. <laughs> when it, It's interesting, isn't it? Because when you start driving through that, then actually you end up building nothing because you, right. because you offend somebody. Or you don't design for for everything. I think does this go back to, I guess what I said at the beginning is, as long as you're, if you're clear on what your intent is, who you are including and who or who you're focusing on, rather than not, then it's interesting because you, because for me then you also then saying, right, I'm not focusing this area, this space is not for. Um, homeless people to sleep in. So therefore, you've then articulated that you recognize that there are homeless people. So therefore, you then should be turned around and saying, right, if they're not going to be here, where do they go? What is their option? What is their opportunity? Um, if this isn't for kids to be on skateboards or groups of kids to go or groups of younger people to go, okay, it's not here. That's 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 fine. But where? Where is it? Where do they go? Where do, what is the, where do you set that other requirement? And there is almost a, uh, that's, that for me is the, almost the crux of it. it actually goes back to a bit yeah. today is the, is the thing of saying, um, if not now, when, if not here, then where? Um, because you, you know, so in the plan, whatever plan that looks like, you've highlighted a set, a, a user set that might not have been thought of, and that's legitimate. We don't necessarily all think of all users all the time. But as soon as you, it's a bit like Pandora's box, as soon as you turn around and say, right, this set of people cannot use this public space. Therefore, there is a requirement for another public space for these people, um, whatever that is. And that's how your, basically, your user requirements come into play on this wider level. This is where we struggle within a human factors perspective because we've, and it's, we've done it around climate change as well, um, that we 
we think around um, the, the the human factors environment that we're talking about as being a singular space, a an, a, a, a bounded environment, a bounded place, a place of work, or it could be a, a vehicle, or it could be whatever. Um, we struggle when it comes when it comes to the wider um, environment, the the bigger the bigger piece, the, right. the, the macro level. Um, so that idea of macroergonomics. Um, and this were, this absolutely plays into that. Yeah, that's that. I mean, that pretty much sums up my thoughts as well. I think this uh, this is a one size fits most, not one size fits all, because you do to to make things equitable, you need that other space that will address the people that are not being served by these design decisions in the the common area right so if you do implement benches with armrests also erect a homeless shelter if you are putting up these metal straps also build a skate park if you are uh you know installing these blue lights then also invest in drug prevention programs and education if you you know like th- the list goes on for every thing that we're patching there is an equal thing that we can be doing on the other side of it to help address the root cause. And I think we're both on the same page for that. Um, this is just a fascinating topic. I like, I feel like we could keep going on and on and on uh, because like we keep bringing up the same examples of those two. They are very easy to talk about, but there is like a whole list of them. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm interested in what others think about this discussion. So I'm going to call to action. Everybody go comment on, on this episode, wherever you're watching or listening to let us know what you think. Uh, Barry, any final thoughts about hostile architecture? I think there is a a lot we can do in the human factors and ergonomics domain around this that perhaps we're not being engaged with or we're not doing because we've got haven't got the the broad enough viewpoint and potentially the influence uh, where we need to have it. Therefore, in a similar to what you've just said, there is a call to action there to um, to happen about to work out right how do we actually get involved in this. And how do we actually make sure our human factors is effective in this space? Yeah, sticking the problem somewhere else is not going to solve it. It's just a patch. All right. So thank you to everyone for selecting our topic this week. And special thanks to our patrons. We also want to thank our friends over at UX Collective for our news story this week. If you want to follow along, we do post links to all the original articles and our weekly roundups in our blog. And you can also join us in our Discord for more discussion on these stories and much more. We're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be back to see what's going on in the Human Factors community right after this. Are you tired of boring lectures and textbooks on Human Factors and UX? Well, grab your headphones and get ready for a wild ride with the Human Factors Minute podcast. Each minute is like a mini crash course packed with valuable insights and information on various organizations, conferences, usability methods, theories, models, certifications, tools, and much more. We'll take you on a journey through the fascinating world of human factors, from the ancient history to the latest trends and developments. Listen in as we explore the field and discover new ways to enhance the user experience. From the think aloud protocol to the critical incident technique, focus groups, iterative design, we'll make sure that you're the smartest person in the room. Tune in on the 10th, the 20th, and the last day of every month for a new and interesting tidbit related to human factors. Don't miss out on the Human Factors Minute podcast your ultimate source for all things human factors. Human Factors Cast brings you the best in human factors news, interviews, conference coverage, and overall fun conversations into each and every episode we produce. But we can't do it without you. The Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running the show come from our listeners. Our patrons are our priority, and we want to ensure we're giving back to you for supporting us. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like access to our monthly Q&As with the hosts, personalized professional reviews, and access to the full library of Human Factors Minute, a weekly podcast where the hosts break down unique, obscure, and interesting human factors topics in just one minute. Patreon rewards are always evolving, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you, and remember, it depends.
Yes, huge thank you, as always, to our patrons. We especially want to thank our Human Factors cast, All Access, and VIP patrons, Michelle Tripp and Neil Ganey. Patrons like you truly keep the show running, truly keep our operations uh, smooth, and I can't even begin to explain like how much that support truly helps the show. Um, speaking of our Patreon, our dumb commercial read this week, and that's the official part of this show that we're calling a dumb commercial read, uh, hey there, Human Factors, HCI, and UX professionals. It's your favorite podcast. I don't know if I'm your favorite hot podcast host. Ready to deliver another exciting live read. Now I know. Wow, this host is always so enthusiastic. Well, I can't help it if my delivery is just that electrifying. Uh, anyway, enough about me. Let's talk about something even more electrifying. Our Patreon page. Yes, that's right. We got exclusive club just for you, our loyal listeners. It's called Human Factors Practitioner Tier. And just for a dollar a month, you get some seriously awesome perks. That includes a Discord channel to connect with other supporters for Patreons only. And uh, enjoy the full audio version of our weekly podcast. We do a pre-show and a post-show every week, so you get the whole thing. It's like having a backstage pass to the most enter- uh, the most entertaining show in town. But wait, there's more. At the $5 tier, you'll not only get all the benefits at a Human Factors Practitioner tier, but you also have access to the full library of Human Factors Minute. Yes, what you see out on the public feed is just a fraction of what we have backstage for you. Um, Now, if you're ready to take the Human Factors experience expertise to the next level, then Human Factors Scientist tier is for you. You'll receive all the other tiers. Uh, This is getting lengthy, so I'm just going to say, Look at our Patreon. It's There's a lot there, and there's plenty of ways for you to support the show, and we make sure to give back at every tier. So, my friends, don't miss out on this exclusive opportunity. Join our Patreon. Become part of the Human Factors Cast family. Just head over on to patreon.com slash humanfactorscast or click on the show notes. Remember, it's not just support. It's a whole new level of Human Factors awesomeness. All right. What do you think of that one, Barry? That was, that was a little rough. But yeah. Uh, Eight out of ten. I think you, you've you've done better, but you've done a lot of worse. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into the next part of the show. It came from. Yes, it came from. This is the wonderful part of the show where we search all over the internet to bring you topics that the human factors community is talking about. If you find any of these answers useful, give us a like or follow to, you know, wherever you're watching or listening to help other people find this content. Algorithms, man. All right. So we got three up tonight. The first one here is by General Building 381 on the UX research subreddit. They write implementing user research from scratch. They write, as someone with a background in design and cultural anthropology, I'm looking to implement user research at my small company to improve sales. I need guidance on starting a UX research role from scratch. Any suggestions on where to begin? Barry? Yeah, I think for me, if if you're just thinking about doing it, why? Well, why do you feel you need to do it? Why? What do you think it's going to achieve? And therefore, what value is it going to bring to your small business? And the reason for, for saying that, it sounds really obvious to say, but if you actually sit, sit down, write it on a bit of paper, um, whatever suits you, that will then enable you to understand the the business need and therefore the business value. That enables you to scope out the initial job role um, and understand who it is that you actually want. Because this could be something that you think might just be an idea, you're not entirely sure what value it brings. Therefore, you might want to bring, you don't want to invest much cost into it. Therefore, you might want to bring somebody more junior in to maybe grow the role. Or you might understand exactly what it needs to do. You're absolutely convinced it's going to bring massive amounts of value, but you want that to happen quickly. Um, so you bring in somebody, you you know, you you invest more up front, you bring in somebody a lot more senior, and they, and hopefully they hit the ground running and bring in their experience of what they want to do. But fundamentally, just saying, oh, I think UX research will, will do some cool stuff. That's the starting point, but you've got a fair bit to do. You know, just asking some simple questions to understand why you think that. Therefore, then it will it'll bring hopefully bring value for you for your business. Nick, what do you think? How how would you get started in that position? Starting something up at a company is hard because there's already an established culture. And so I mean, if this person is looking to hire UX research, then that's one thing. If they have a UX research background and how to build it up, that's a different thing. And I want to talk about the second piece because the decision on whether or not to include user research or 
UX at a company is is separate. And I think this one, this this other side will have a lot more uh, actionable impact. And so when you think about trying to start something up from scratch, you have to change culture. And so to do that, you need to interact with all the groups. It's easier at smaller companies because then you know everybody involved at larger companies that uh, you, you need a much larger support system to try to get that momentum of, hey, include us six months ago and not two weeks before the thing ships. You know, like there's there's a lot of um, a lot of things that need to happen in order for that cultural change within a company to happen. And so just understanding where that company is at, who the major players are in that process and trying to change the minds of those people so that way it trickles down into UX research is probably the way that I would go. Okay, let's get into this next one here. How long did it take you to become confident in your interview skills? This is by Gerg Murf on Excellent. the UX research. Thanks. On the UX research subreddit. <laughs> right. Asking for advice. How many interviews did it take you to feel confident in your abilities? Now this is user interviews, not like job interviews. Barry, what do you think? Um, define confidence. I think um, I'm more than happy and content that I can go and interview people. You know, I can go and interview. That's that's not a problem. But only if I've done my preparation. Only if I've done the the requisite steps that you need to go up and do that sort of interview in the first place. Because I can be the best interviewer in the world if I don't actually have the plan. If I don't have the questions in place. Um, well, I'm going to be rubbish. I'm going to be absolutely rubbish because that, you know, I often say that the, you know, the interview is only a, a quarter of the actual job. Um, because yes, it's, it's a bit where you're, you're interactive. So, um, there is, there is a level of practice and, uh, and I guess experience there for when thing more for when things happen that you don't expect. Um, and maybe the way that you craft some of the questions, um, or you're, you know, you're crafting the way that the interview is going to go, and maybe you get a curveball that you weren't expecting. Being able to handle that type of thing is is something that you do pick up with experience. Um, but even then, I think it, it's it didn't actually take me that many interviews to realize that it was about preparation. I, I did trip myself up quite badly um, through non preparation, and I swore never to make that that mistake again. Nick, what do you think? Yeah, I think it it is really all in the prep work, and I think there there can be a lot of flailing with juniors and and not understanding what it is they're asking, and so I guess the actionable insight here would be to when you do prep, understand the intent behind each question. What is it that you are trying to learn when you ask them that question? Is it an opening to a deeper question that you're trying to understand? The, you know, their process. So it is a lot in the prep. Try to understand for, for them the best of your ability to the best of your ability, what it is that they do in their role. So that way you can already start to meet them. Like if it's a brand new domain, brand new thing, you're going to try to go out and understand exactly, not exactly, but most 90% of what they do in their role. And then to get that other 10% about the user needs, that's kind of where the magic of the interview comes in, or even 80-20, that's fine too. Just understand a lot about what it is that they do, and then you'll find those surprises as you start to ask them, and you can almost have them challenge your assumptions, and that's great. Uh, so it is all in the prep work. That's it. All right, this last one here is a kind of on-the-fly decision we made tonight. We got a question in YouTube, uh, on our YouTube by Bailey, saying, uh, experiencing fear of failure in UX research career. Bailey writes, I'm experiencing a vulnerable time in my UX research career where I have a fear of failure. Thoughts on this? Barry, fear of failure. I never fear failure. I'm completely lying. Okay. All right, um, moving on. No, I, the, um, no, I think uh, the, the fear of failure is is there constantly. And I think if you didn't, if you didn't if you weren't concerned about failure then i'd be wondering are you challenging yourself are you doing um are you doing interesting things i've spoken before about imposter syndrome and um, which i think goes hand in glove with, with this type of thing um of which is something i know i suffer from on a um, more than regular basis but it's almost part of what makes this job interesting and exciting uh it all, which also leads itself to the the 
that potential for you to think that it's all going to go wrong. So you, we go into new domains um, when you go into new teams uh, because we largely work, um, or partic- certainly I've worked a lot as a you know as, as, as a single person in a in a role. Um, you may be the one human factors person or one ergonomist, one researcher um, in a in an organisation. And so there's a lot of pressure on you at that point. That makes it really exciting. That makes it really fun because you can go and scope things. You can do things, but actually you're also sitting there going, well, am I doing it right? What happens if somebody else um, comes along and looks at what I'm doing and goes, you're doing it all wrong. You should be doing it like this. You should be doing X, X, Y, Z. Um, So it is all there. However, there is a lot of this where... um, just be be confident in your own abilities, but also don't be afraid of sharing your concerns. If you're in, if you got, uh, if you're in a position where you have got line management structure, share it with your line manager, share it with your peers. Um, and if anybody else then says, "Oh well, I don't fear failure," then they're lying, um, or they're not being honest with you um, for whatever reason. Therefore, they're, they're not they're not that good a mate. Um, so. Talk about it. And talking about it, I think, is the biggest and best thing that you can do. Um, because not only are you highlighting to others where you, you know, to hopefully get some um, comfort, uh, some um, assurance from people that actually know you're great, but also you're showing to other people who may be fit, having the same fear of failure, actually, it's fine to talk about this um, and we can do it. So on button, talk about it. Nick, I've waffled on quite a lot. Do you fear failure? Are you going to, are you fear of failure of answering this question properly? And you're on mute. Ah, podcasting for how long? And I do that. Um, (laughs) I think this is an interesting question because I am thinking about this in a way that I relate to. So for me, Fear of failure goes hand in hand, like you said, with imposter syndrome. But what is failure? And in the opposite direction, what is success? And I think when we start to think about what these things are, what is failure, what is success, and we sort of widen the aperture of what success looks like and close the aperture of what failure looks like, then you can kind of uh, sort of participate in the (laughs) self-compassion that I've had to learn uh, when it comes to these things, right? So like, is failure what? Losing a job? Okay, yeah, that's that's unfortunate. Can you find another job afterward? Is it going to end your career? (laughs) What, What would you, like, I think that is something that, you know, is there a career ending move that you can perform? And then think about the things that would be career ending moves. Have you done any of those? Probably not. I I mean, probably not. You might have, but I don't think so. Is it is it something that might get you fired from a job? Yeah. Okay. Fine. That, you know, move on. And it's it's easy to say move on. But again, what is the aperture of success and what is the aperture of failure? For me, success could just mean getting through this podcast and answering this question. It could also mean doing you know something successful at work. And what I found that is helpful is to document the wins or the successes that you experience or that people have said about your work. So that way you can remind yourself, ah, this is the perception. I have sort of higher standards for myself that I need to work through. And if I don't meet those standards, is that failure? Maybe this is something that I've worked through with my therapist. I don't know, but it's, uh, (laughs) you know, widen that aperture of what success is, what failure is, and um, some practice that self-forgiveness because sometimes your standards of yourself can be so high that anything seems like failure outside of that window. And so that's where I'm coming from. Anyway, it's time for one more thing. Barry, what's your one more thing this week? <laughs> so this week we had um, an interesting thing where my daughter's finished her first year at university. And so we had to move her out of her university halls into a house that she's renting for for the second year. And I don't understand how such a small flat, such a small apartment that she was living in, can hold so much stuff. Um, Also, she was on the third floor of this without a lift. And so I was got very bored very quickly of what of trudging up and down and up and down and up and downstairs. Um, 
what was the most interesting, or, and I did it, you could tell where tiredness was coming into play, where I got up to, I knew I had to go up three flights of stairs. And so, I, but more than, in fact, I think it happened about three times, I actually got to the second floor and opened up the door for the second floor a bit and actually think, because all the stuff was piled on the landing, opened up, it's all gone. That's really weird. Where's it all gone? And realized I still had another another flight of stairs to walk up. And when when you're tired and you're exhausted and swear words are just not enough anymore, that's where I had to dig deep and crack on. So yeah, an, an interesting experience yesterday um, of doing that, and then ended with um, learning more about different types of uh, tequila and margaritas. So fun day was had by all. Nick, what about you? What was your uh, what, what's your one more thing? Uh, well, uh, there's a summer sedale, and I got a Steam Deck. Um, it's kind of like a Switch, but it plays PC games. So uh, I will say I've, I'm like fairly new to it. I just got it um, like two days ago. So I'm like doing all the setup. I will say two things. One, setting up uh, games that are on the platform that you like Steam, right? If you buy games on Steam, you can play them very easily if they are compatible with the deck. And that's very nice. Um, very easy to use. Now, the thing is, if you have a bunch of different games across different platforms like I do, different stores, that takes a little bit more tinkering. Um, when it get when you get it working, it's extremely satisfying. So um, it's it's good for tinkerers in the sense that you can actually get stuff to work. It's not completely closed off. Uh, and so that's that's nice. And I'm learning Linux uh, how to, and how to do all that. So that's that's cool. Um, well, that's it for today, everyone. If you like this episode, enjoy some of the discussion about architecture. I'll go encourage you to go listen to our episode 254 on The Line, where we talk about that new city they're building without roads, cars, or emissions. Comment wherever you're listening with what you think of the story this week. For more in-depth discussion, you can always join our Discord community. Visit our official website, sign up for our newsletter, stay up to date with all the latest Human Factors news. You like what you're doing? You like what we're doing? You want to support the show? There's a couple things. Uh, well, if you like what you're doing, give yourself a pat on the back. You deserve it, too. Uh, but if, if you want to support the show, there's a couple things you could do for us. You could leave us a five-star review. We'll take that. Uh, that's free for you to do. You can tell your friends about us. That's also free for you to do and really helps the show grow. And if you want to uh, and have the financial means to, you can always support us on Patreon. We'll take your money and we'll put it to good use. I promise. And as always, links to all of our socials and our website are in the description of this episode. Stick around if you're watching live for a post show. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Barry Kirby for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about hostile architecture and benches? If you want to come and talk about benches, then find me on social media, particularly on Twitter at Baz underscore K. Also now on Threads, which is interesting. Um, but if you want to come and listen to interesting interviews with people in and around the Human Factors community, then find me at 1202 on the Human Factors podcast at 1202podcast.com. As for me, if you want to talk to me being a naughty bench, you can find me on Discord <laughs> at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors cast. Until next time. It, it depends. depends. <laughs>